Yes. <laughs> Don't look for one minute. I'm not doing Okay. Hello and welcome to the Kingston Library's live stream of our event, Authors in Conversation, where I, Sally Hepworth, will be interviewing Lisa Island about her new book, The Secret Life of Shirley Sullivan. Lisa and I have both been looking forward to this event immensely, both because we would get to talk about books and also because it signalled our first venture out of the house in quite some time. <laughs> so true. So today, over the course of the interview, we're going to talk about Lisa's new book. We're going to talk about life as a published author and also about launching a book during a global pandemic. There'll also be an opportunity to ask questions by just entering it into the chat bar. Um, so if you do have a question, don't hesitate and we'll make sure that we answer that for you. Finally, before, you, before we begin, I want to let you know that Lisa's book, The Secret Life of Shirley Sullivan, is available at all good bookstores and also available to be downloaded from the Kingston Library's e-audio collection to listen to. All right, so Lisa, here we are. The Secret Life of Shirley Sullivan was released on the 28th of April, yep. which is right in the middle of a global pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great can, timing. Can you tell us a bit about what that was like and how that was different to previous releases? Yeah, sure. So I guess uh, this is my sixth book, so it's the sixth um, time I've had a, a, a book released and usually the, usually in the lead up we plan lots of events and we actually had um, you and I and uh yourself yourself myself and Rachel Johns had planned to go on um, a tour of, of Victoria at least um, so normally there's lots of live events that you would come to places like here like to the library but instead of like we're doing today um, coming to you via live stream normally we'd have a really big audience and we'd get to talk to people and so I I guess what happened was about um a week before, or maybe two weeks before the book's re release, we started to realise that the tour that I was planned to go on was not going to happen, that really most of the events, even ones planned into June and July, uh, festivals and whatnot, were starting to be cancelled. So I realised that the you know the excitement around the book was not going to be possibly the same, or that was the fear. Um, we were really worried because also there was a fear that books wouldn't get into bookshops so mm. that because we at that point didn't really know what was going to happen with the pandemic so we didn't know whether there would be supply we didn't even know if books shops or uh, department stores would stay, stay open so it was a really scary scary time mm. um, but it's actually turned out not to be as dire as we've thought because um libraries and bookshops and the book community the reading community in general have just really jumped on board to yeah. support authors who've got a new release authors with new releases out at the same time so people who had books coming out in sort of April or May we all banded together we all sort of very quickly made contact with each other and worked out how we could support each other yeah. so we were making sure that we were when we were doing something to promote our own book that we were promoting other people's books who, at, who were coming out at the same time and as I said, the libraries adapted really quickly so that things like this could happen. We could have live streams from um, from libraries and from booksellers as well. So mm. um, it's surprising how well people have adapted. And one of the great things is that, it, I mean, nothing replaces having a live audience. So, and I really do miss that, miss having people to talk to and miss getting to sign people's books. But the one thing about the live streams is that we do, there is the potential to reach a larger audience yeah. because sometimes people for whatever reason are not able to get down to their local library, perhaps the event's taking place when they're at work or they've got little children mm. or whatever, they're, they're not well, but they can actually turn on the computer and watch a live stream. So in, in that aspect, it's actually been, that's been a bonus. And, and like I said, I think the, the actual feeling of community and camaraderie between authors with new releases and um, 
and just book lovers in general, readers, had a lot of love from the reading community. Yes. So that's been, yeah, that's been really nice. Yeah, and bookstores as well have yeah. been really doing some really interesting and innovative stuff, haven't they? Oh, absolutely. Like my local bookstore um, has been delivering, mm. um, which she has always done, Stacey from Book Road's always done that. Um, but, of course, it's been a much more um, a service that's been much more widely used. But booksellers have definitely got on board as well to do events like this in conjunction with libraries um, and also to, you know, just help out wherever they can by either delivering the book, making recommendations. Mm. So it's been fantastic. For those of you who are close to um, Ocean Grove, actually Lisa bandied with her local bookstore um, because everyone had to rally and do what they could um, to offer to personally deliver any copies of The Secret Life of Shirley Sullivan. I, I haven't had to do it yet. Have you? No, we've sold, she's sold well, out. of. She's had she's sold loads of copies and I've been in there three times to sign, like not sign while the bookstore was open, but to, to sign copies. But um, I haven't had well, a anyone on the Bellerin Peninsula. That's what it is. Yeah, it is the Bellerin Peninsula, the other peninsula. You can have your opportunity to meet Lisa Island in person and have her deliver your books at a safe, safe here. social distance. At, yes, <laughs> one point five no meters, <laughs> or get it for a friend. What a gift! Um, but speaking of the secret life of Shirley Sullivan, can you tell us a little bit about? this book and about uh, what your what was the inspiration for it and if you wouldn't mind, maybe read us a short passage. I shall. In any particular I, order. Yeah, just for you, <laughs> only for you. She doesn't I'm, like to read. I'm not a fan <laughs> of reading my own work, but Sally did give me a heads up that she would ask me to do, do this and I did reluctantly agree. I don't <laughs> think I'm a great um, orator in that respect. But I'll tell you what the book's about first for uh, those of you watching that don't know. And um, and then what was the second part to tell you? Tell me about the book. Tell me what inspired the oh, book. All right. Okay. And good. then read. All right. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so the book's called The Secret Life of Shirley Sullivan. It is about 79-year-old Shirley who steals her husband Frank from his uh, suburban nursing home in Sydney and takes him on a wild ride on a, a, a road trip down the south coast of New South Wales and into Gippsland in Victoria. Um, and the reason that Shirley does this is it's, it's multifaceted, but she first of all thinks that Frank is not doing well in the nursing home where he's living. He's not there at her um request. She has been um, usurped by her daughter, Fiona, who's uh, middle-aged and who has medical guardianship over uh, Frank. So for reasons which become apparent if you read the book. So, so she, Shirley's not in control. She doesn't think that Frank belongs in the nursing home and that he will do better because Frank is suffering from dementia and she kind of feels like if he's outside of the confines of the home that he will, um, that his memory will be will maybe not miraculously come back, but that he will be happier and healthier. And But she's also wants to take him on this particular road trip because um, it's something that he's always wanted to do and they've never mani managed to do it before in their married life. And she's also, the reason that it's important to her to do it right now is that Frank's slipping away and she wants to atone for something that's happened in their marriage, as, which is a secret that she's kept from him for their pretty much almost all their married life. So that's basically the premise. Um, so it takes place in the present day um, over a week. So they're on the run for a week. But we also, there's a historical timeline as well. So we get to see Frank and Shirley from when they met in 1961 right through till uh, the two timelines converge uh, in the present day. So it, there's a lot of it is set in the 1960s and 70s. So, and the inspiration is, and why I've got the two timelines, the inspiration came from two separate things. One is um, a newspaper article that I read, I reckon it would be over a decade ago now, um, and it was about this elderly couple in the United States who had... Um, escaped from their nursing home and gone on the run from the authorities. And I think the, the most interesting thing about that story is that 
like lots of not lots but several there's often cases you often hear about people wandering off from um aged care facilities um but often they're lost yeah. you know they've just wandered off accidentally they've become disorientated for some reason but this story was different this this was kind of like a bit of a bonnie and clyde story because um the couple really had a destination I don't know what the destination was but they clearly had a destination in mind and they evaded the authorities actively so they went on the run for four or five days they were actually caught at one point by the police or the sheriff I'm not sure which um uh, in a particular state and then managed to talk their way out of um of custody not that they were being held because it's illegal but they were they were being held for their own safety um but yeah, the the Such elderly <laughs> the elderly woman um, managed to convince the authorities that no, that they had it all wrong and they weren't the people, and and they let them go, and they went on the run for a couple more days before they were eventually um, detained. And so that just really captured my imagination. That story, I was like, who does that? Like they were they were in they were octogenarians and they were so feisty and yeah. yeah so I just thought it was a great great story and I always wondered where it was they were going to so I had that story sort of ticking away in the back of my head for years and years and years but it never really quite felt finished it never felt I never felt that the story was developed enough to uh make a whole novel but then about um about two years ago my house got flooded and I had to empty out the contents um, of my bedroom and my um, walk-in robe. And I had, like many, many people do, boxes of memorabilia stored in the um, in the wardrobe. And one of these boxes had come from my parents' home, which I just brought from, from their place after they died and packed it away, always intending to go through it, but um, I never quite had. And then the box got damaged. It was just a cardboard sort of archive box and the box got damaged. So I had to open it up and check what was inside to see if the contents were okay. And what I found was, I'm going to show you, 67 of, it's, it's a bit hard to see because we're far away from the camera. I'm going to lean in there, but, oh, you're going to go forward as well. So, that's it, yeah. 67 letters um, between from my mum to my dad and from my dad to my mum. Um, and so these letters uh, started in 1961 when uh, my mum, my, my dad was a surf lifesaver and my dad had been down in the Geelong region for, say. yeah, for the, um, for a surf carnival. So... Um, yeah, that's him in his in his surf life saving gear, um, and so he he'd come down to Geelong. He came from Gippsland um, in Victoria country country Victoria from Lindenau, a little tiny town, and he was down um, in in the Geelong region for this surf carnival. And he met my mum at a dance at the Palais um, at the Palais Royal um, dance hall. And mum already had a boyfriend and um, who she was quite going quite steady with and who really uh, she had expected to marry, but uh, dad kind of swept her off her feet. And so they lived apart, obviously, for uh, a few years. So these letters took place between 19, 1961 and 1963, 67 of them. When I found them, I laid them out. Like I and put them in chronological order and then read them. It was like reading a novel, which was very wow. exciting for me because my family, yeah. you know. So it was, it, it was interesting because it was my mum and dad, and it's a beautiful love story. But it's not really exciting enough for a book if it's not your parents because it's actually quite a dull story in that they met, um, they fell in love, they got married, they had kids, they lived happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's nice, but it's not a really exciting novel. Um, but what was interesting in the letters, um, apart from the beautiful love story, was all the historical detail. So things like at one point mum mentions crying as she's watching the funeral for President Kennedy um, wow. on the TV, which is, I mean, it's quite stupid of me, but I, I never made that, that sort of connection with history and my own parents. Yeah. Like you, you kind of just don't draw those conclusions and the other thing for me as a writer that was really interesting was the language that they used um 
the language of the time. Like my dad's letters are peppered with expressions like wacko. (laughs) (laughs) So do you remember him saying wacko? Never, never. So no, not at all. So (laughs) it it just shows you how language evolves over time. And that was something like that's, that's, What's interesting as a writer about, about having a primary source when you're writing a, an historical timeline, yep. because they're the things that the history books leave out, mm. and that you can't, you just can't get that information. Yeah, just true. you know, like you, it, it's not something that's readily available. The expressions of the time and and the context in which they were used. Um, yeah, so. Um, I, I suddenly sort of realised, I thought, oh, there's that story of the octogenarians and the yeah, the road trip and then there's this beautiful love story. And I actually had a little chat to my agent about the about this book and, I was, and she said to me, oh, you know, it all sounds great, sounds lovely, but why, why does she want to take him on the road trip? Like, and I said, oh, you know, because they've never managed to do it and she's all, he's, he's always wanted to and now he's got dementia. And she said, yeah, that's nice, but... It needs something more. And that was when I realised that the storyline would need an explosive secret. And strangely, I didn't know what the secret was until mm-hmm. I got to it. So I like I had ideas about what it might be, but it was one of those things that the character actually led me to the secret rather than me yeah. writing towards it. So um yeah so and obviously I don't want to talk about what the secret is because no, spoilers. No spoilers um but yeah so that that was sort of the elements that made the book so you're going to make me read uh, now if, if you wouldn't mind well okay <laughs> I just have to find the little bit you can tap down if, for a moment while I while I find it see just if take you ask me a second. her to do something live she's got no choice but no see yeah to go ahead and do it is my trick Okay, so this is towards the end of the very first chapter and Shirley's arrived at the nursing home um, to find Frank is outside in the courtyard in the sun. Frank is sitting in a wicker chair under the shade of the jacaranda tree. His legs are stretched out in front of him and his trouser legs are rolled up so his skin catches the dappled sunlight. He's always been a sun worshipper. My pink-coated lips form a wide smile as I wave to him, but he continues to, sh- to stare into the middle distance. There's not a flicker of recognition on his face. Today is not a good day. One of the male carers, a new one whose name I can't recall, places a garden chair next to Frank and beckons for me to sit. I thank him and he nods and moves away to give us a modicum of privacy. Not that there's really any such thing in this place. I sit and turn my head to Frank, resting the urge to touch him. It's lovely out here today. He looks at me and I see the confusion in his eyes. I think it's my voice that does it. The sound is familiar, but he can't quite place me. It is indeed. I try not to let my disappointment show on my face. I'm grateful for the days that he still recognises me, and although they're happening less and less. It's been months since he recognised Fiona. I think that's the reason she keeps finding excuses not to visit. The pain of seeing her beloved daddy like this is more than she can bear. Most of the time, I have little patience for her discomfort. Do you think I like seeing him the way he is? I've said on more than one occasion. This isn't about us. It's about your father. But on days like today, when Frank's eyes glaze over and he treats me like a friendly stranger, I resolve to be more sympathetic towards my daughter. I point to the exposed skin on his legs. I hope you have sunscreen on. Easy to get burned in beautiful weather like this. He screws up his nose. Sunscreen, can't stand the stuff. Makes the sand stick to your skin. He smiles indulgently. You sound like my wife. She's always trying to get me to put sun cream on when I'm on patrol. She's fair skinned, you see. Only has to look at the sun and she gets burned, but not me. My skin's tough as old boots. Even if I go a bit pink at first, I end up tanned. My Shirley can't seem to understand that. I bite my tongue and refrain from talking about skin cancer. He's had half a dozen basal cell carcinomas cut out over the past decade. But of course, the Frank sitting next to me doesn't know that. He's back in his youth. Instead, I say, so you like the beach then? 
he nods. Yeah, it's my second home. I'm a lifesaver, you know, at Bankura. Lovely little beach. Best spot in the world, if you ask me. He closes his eyes for a moment. When he opens them again, they're brighter, as though he's, as though he's just had a wonderful idea. Look, you couldn't do me a favour, could you? You couldn't give a bloke a lift. I need to get back home to Cheryl. She's probably worried sick by now. I got lost somehow and ended up in this place. I keep telling them that I need to get home, but no one's listening. I'm listening. He breaks into a heartwarming smile. So you will take me home? I want to take him in my arms and promise him everything will be all right. But today I'm a stranger to him and I don't want to cause him further distress by crossing any boundaries. The staff tell me that when he's like this, it's best to play along as much as possible. I can't today, I say carefully. I don't have my car. His face falls momentarily before he regains his composure. Tomorrow then? It pains me to hear the desperation in his voice. Yes, love, I say, and it's a blessed relief that this time I don't have to lie. Tomorrow. There we go. Oh, wow. <laughs> you read that. I know. I've read it many times, but it still always you know, stops me. It's really hard. I've just realised as I was reading, it's really hard for me to read out loud because this book's available um, on audiobook. And the two narrators, there's two narrators, there's one for the older Shirley, mm. which is actually Deborah Kennedy, um, who Deborah Kennedy was in A Place to Call Home. So some people might remember her from that. But she's also the voice of not that ad, not Happy Jan. Um, and so she's <laughs> got the most perfect voice. She's got the most perfect voice for older Shirley. If I, I couldn't have imagined any anyone better. And then the younger voice, I think is Harriet Gordon myth I want to say I hope I've got that right she's also perfect like mm. absolutely perfect so when I read it it doesn't sound anywhere as good I've listened oh. to a chapter each of Deborah and of Harriet reading it um and they were both so perfect so I feel a bit squeamish no, about reading it no. myself well it still sounded good and as I was listening I thought how it is so many things this book but at its heart, it is this really unconventional love story. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I find interesting about that is that this is obviously not your first novel. You have been you've got quite a long history of publishing in Australia and you actually got your start in writing romance, which is quite different, mm. obviously, <laughs> yes. to this. But there is a love story at its core. And um, I guess what I'm interested in is do you think you have found your true love in women's fiction now, um, do you think that you might end up venturing back to romance? Do you think that you might sort of marry the two up again in the future? What, what do you have to say about that? I never know what I'm going to write. Yeah. <laughs> um, my start in romance was accidental, so I didn't set out to write a romance novel. It just turned out to be one. So the backstory to that is... Um, I'm a primary school teacher. I was a primary school teacher, so I had 20 years of teaching, um, really, before I became an author. But my very first uh, foray into teaching was at a tiny little school in Gippsland um, called Longford Primary School. And I had grown up in the city. I was a confirmed city girl, and I went off to Longford with all these ideas about what it would be like to live in the city. I had, you know, visions of fat, white fluffy sheep and lovely lamingtons that the CWA ladies might bestow <laughs> upon me. I thought that's probably what it was all about. But it was a bit of a rude awakening <laughs> <laughs> because quite a few things happened re really early on in my time there. Like in the very first week, um, I proved to the whole com community that I was quite a fool because <laughs> uh, we had... In the first week, we had a storm that uh, with lightning. So, so we had we had this storm and lightning strikes, and a bushfire, a small bushfire started, of which I was I was left standing on the school oval as the sirens went off. We were at a bush dance at the school, a welcome bush dance, and all the CFA sirens went off and I just watched in amazement as the whole school community disappeared because they most of them were either members of the CFA or they had a role to play and I was sort of standing there with my, you know, big jukeboxy thing because I was the music teacher. Um, 
going, where is everyone going? So we had a bushfire, then a storm that led to a flood, and it meant that we were cut off from the nearest big town and there was no, there was a general store in Longford but no petrol station and it was a like a 40 or 50 kilometre round trip to go and get petrol because we had to go, the nearest uh, next town um, was, a, yeah, about 30 k's away and they only had a very small service station, wasn't open very many hours and so I ran out of petrol in the like so and had to be rescued by a member of the community so they kind of adopted me this little town of Longford and they knew that I was a city hopeless idiot <laughs> um and yeah that and they sort of embraced me and and took me into their community and I loved that and it when I went back to the city I always wanted to write about that experience, just that being embraced by that community and the joys of living in a rural community and there and the hardships as well. Mm. Um, and so when I went to write my first book, which ended up being a, a romance called Breaking the Drought, um, that was the backdrop that it was set against. It, it wasn't my story, but it was a story about um, a city journalist that ends up being trapped in a rural town and then... Um, and, and falls in love with one of the inhabitants. But it wasn't it wasn't that I set out to write a romance. It was just sort of the story that came. And at that time, because it was a long time ago when I actually drafted that book, um, I there were no publishers of romance in Australia. You mm. couldn't submit to a publisher in Australia. You had to go overseas. So I submitted to Mills and Boone in the UK um, and they were very interested but they wanted me to change it in quite significant ways. So they wanted me to take out a lot of the characters because I'd created this big community, which is all my books always have. Quite, even if it's only from one point of view, I also have a large cast of sort of supporting characters, I guess, and I'm interested in communities. And so that was, to me, the heart of the book, but they wanted it to focus on the couple and not the extra characters, and they thought it was a bit Australian. <laughs> so oh. they wanted me to change, perhaps I could set it somewhere else or, you know, peel back the Australianness a bit. But it never wow. ended up being published. Uh, there, but eventually it got published here because the the rural romance boom happened, and when that started to happen, I thought, hey, I've got one of those books sitting away in a drawer. Maybe someone would publish it, and somebody did, which was Harlequin Australia. So, um, yeah, so that was it was just an accident. But then when I had one of those published. Harlequin, it was quite, it, strangely, it was quite successful. Um, <laughs> so, it was my first book and I had no expectations, but it sold, it was only available digitally originally, um, but it sold lots of copies. And so then Harlequin were keen for me to write another one, which I did, which was also quite successful. Um, and so then I did a third one. Um, but then um, so that was probably, I thought, going to be my path in writing was to just keep writing these rural stories. But the thing is, I I live in regional Australia, I live in Ocean Grove by the coast, but I don't really live in the country. Mm. I didn't grow up in the country. It's not like I had a couple of stories to tell, but it's not like a rich vein for me to tap. Yeah. So um, I was kind of at, at the end of what I had to say about that subject and um, I was trying to write a fourth one and I got quite blocked and then our friend our mutual friend Rachel Johns who does write lots of rural romances said to me because she knew I had this other idea for a book that was not a rural romance that I kept toying with but not actually writing she said why don't you give that one a go and just get some ideas down on paper and it might unblock you so I did that but instead of just toying around with it I ended up writing the whole book and then that became the shape of us which was my first women's fiction book, so, one of my favourite books. So thank you. So I think it's really about what I'm interested in mm. at the time. So I'm really, and I'm, you know, I, I'm halfway through, I'm just going to tell you this now and your eyes are going to pop out of your head maybe because <laughs> Is this I haven't said I this. I don't know. Well, okay. Well, I, I'm halfway through a new book about another older protagonist in a town and hasn't been going very well. And then I've just had an idea for something set in London. And so I'm not actually sure which one of those ideas I'm going to write. I, I often do this. I do often write thirty or 40,000 words of a book and then go, oh, not really feeling it. 
No, because I don't plan very, as you do know. I do know that. I don't plan very much. Um, and so I'm not a plotter like Sally. Sally's a very big plotter, aren't you? Yeah, well, I think could definitely compared to you. Yeah, compared to me. <laughs> we actually, so sometimes Sally tries to make me plot. Um, that never ends well. No. One of us in tears usually. Yes. I, often both. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell us about that. I was going to ask you something else, but this is much more interesting. Tell us about, um, because I know at least of one other book that you've abandoned at about this far in. Has there been more than that? And do you feel like this turn to something new is just about this is the book that you were meant to be writing or that you were, you know, you, that maybe the book that you're abandoning is something for later? Like, how does that process work for you? I don't know. I think both times that I've done it, um, so it's twice that it's happened that I've been writing something for a publisher and then gone, I just can't finish this book. I just don't like it. Mm. So the first time was that one that we just talked about where I was writing another rural romance, um, which was about a, a rock star. And I had a, it was a really well-developed idea and I really liked the idea but I didn't like the execution. Yeah. Um, and I had written, I don't know, about 30,000 words of that. And then, so, and then I wrote The Shape of Us, which up until Shirley has been my favourite book. Yeah. Um, and that just poured out of me like it, it was like some it was almost like it was channeled like yes. somebody else wrote it no I, I just typed the words then I wrote The Art of Friendship which was a more planned book and as you know I found that book very difficult to write mm. and it was like getting blood from a stone so it was a quite a difficult book to write um, and then I started Pieces of Me which is the book that you're talking about where I wrote 40,000 words that was a book about grief um, it actually made me depressed <laughs> when I was writing it. Um, again, I loved the idea and I actually went to New York to research that idea um, because it was about a woman running the New York Marathon because, as Sally knows and some um, some viewers might know, I like to run very, very slowly but um, I'm a runner and I'd love to do a marathon but I think I'm got to the point where that's not ever going to happen for me so I thought I'd make a character do it instead <laughs> um and I love the New York Marathon it's such an iconic race it's often televised here in Australia and I often watch it did you know that I often watch the I I I'm finding do, out all sorts of things I do here. love to watch marathon races and I always cry so I think that's the stuff of good fiction because it, all, it wow. makes me emotional and so I got to 40,000 words in that book couldn't go any further and then I wrote Shirley and Again, when I started to write Shirley, it just poured out and I didn't have any difficulties. So I think with the London idea, I might give that a go mm. and if it comes easily, then it's the book I'm meant to be writing. Otherwise, I'm maybe it's just an exercise in procrastination and I'll go back to... I think we're discovering your process because my two favourite books have been The Shape of Us and The Secret Life of Shirley Sullivan and so perhaps your process is not plotting. It's just writing 40,000 words of a book that's never going to get published. Yeah, maybe that is it. It doesn't seem very efficient, no. does it? I wouldn't recommend it if there's any no. aspiring authors out there. Follow Sally's process. Hers is much more efficient. <laughs> I don't know, but you're getting the good results. Oh, I think you're getting the good results too. <laughs> I don't, don't, don't. I think the, le the lesson is to do it however you do it. Yeah, I think, you're, I think you're right. It's and as many hard. authors as we talk to, everybody's uh, process is slightly different. Like there's, there's absolutely not one way to do it, is there? There's not. There's not at all. Well, that's probably a good – I love talking about the writing process. And now let's switch gears a little bit into – reading which as we know is a um a big part of writing it definitely is can you tell us about your life reading growing up did you have strong reading models in your life and do, how do you think that affected you as a writer sure. um both my parents were really big readers um i was particularly influenced by my mum my mum would read to me every night before bed um until strangely enough until i would till i could read myself when i I was probably about four and a half and then she, I was not a child that liked to be read to, strangely, I like, which is odd. Um, she still but, can't listen to Audible. She no, I don't like audio no. books. I appreciate them. I think that I, I would rather read the words myself. I like print. 
Um, so she's yeah. very finicky, Lisa. You've heard it here first. <laughs> I am. I do. I have listened to a few more audio books recently. You'll be surprised to hear, and but enjoyed them not as much as print. But they're <laughs> they, they're good in a if you've got a long car car trip or yeah, you know. So when I'm doing the housework, sometimes I mm. now because I can kill two birds with one stone. But yeah, no, I love to read. I'm a voracious reader. Both my parents were really um, big readers, and Mum particularly influenced me in reading. We lived in an outer western suburb of Melbourne and it was a newly developed suburb at the time in the 1960s and there was no library but we did have the mobile library which oh. I just loved and my mum would take me every uh, every fortnight and we'd come to the local Woolworths, it wasn't whatever it was called, Safeway it probably was back then, um, in the car park at Safeway and we'd trundle over, we'd ride our bikes over, mum would walk over and we'd come back with this big stack of books um, because I was a vor voracious reader and my parents were not well off at that point in time and so they couldn't have possibly afforded to keep me in the amount of books that I would go through even with the library and the amount of books that I could borrow I would probably be finished before the library came back so and then as I got a little bit bigger um Werribee Library was developed, um, which is halfway bet between Werribee and, Har and Hoppers Crossing, where I lived, and uh, the big council library. And that was there for years. It's since moved, but it was there for years and years. And I, it was close enough for me to ride my bike there by myself. I would spend almost every Saturday at the library just reading. And then as I got older, studying and researching. And um, so n netball in the winter, library in the summer, a little bit of com <laughs> combination. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so I, and I, then as a teacher too, like one of my, the, the most rewarding thing as a teacher was teaching children to read and mm. seeing kids, you know, get access to the the pleasure of enjoying a book when they can de decode and get it themselves. So, yes, yeah. yeah, so I loved that. I loved taking kids to the local library and teaching them how to borrow and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So the, the library's had a really big influence and books have had a really big influence on me since I was little things like um, Anne of Green Gables, oh, yes. Little Women, that yes. was a big, um, and also all the Laura Ingalls Wild, oh, Wild little, little, House, little House yes. on the Prairie, Little House in the Big Woods. Um, I was also a big fan, you're probably too young for these, but I was a big fan of the What Katie Did series. So oh, I don't know them. What Katie did, what Katie did at school, uh, what Katie did next. Look them up. They're really cute. I will. Um, but you know what is I think is fantastic now, and and this is across children's literature and adult literature, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute yeah. with what I've um, been reading, is when I was growing up there were, weren't examples from Australia, all the books came, all the things that I was reading, like I was a big Enid Blyton fan, yeah, oh, for too. instance, but all the literature was coming from somewhere else. Mm. Remember Devouring Seven Little Australians, which was written like a 100 years before I was born, yeah. but I, was, I think I was so enamoured of it, it because it described an Australian experience, even though I, it was not relatable in terms of the time because it's historical. Yeah. It was relatable because they were talking about gum trees, eucalypts, mm. and places that resonated with me rather than English boarding schools, which I which I loved yeah. being transported to the English boarding schools. Don't get I really wanted to go to boarding school oh, when I read the, you know those the uh, naughty girls. Girl. Yes, I desperately wanted to go to boarding school. Be head school. boy or head girl. Yeah, absolutely. Like head yeah. girl. Yeah. <laughs> Head person. Head person. Well, head person. So, yeah, I loved I loved reading those books, but I'm really excited when my kids were growing up to be able to share Australian literature with them. Yes. And like I said, it's not that long ago that if you were writing commercial fiction in Australia, particularly uh, women-centred mm. commercial fi fiction, there was not a publisher you could go to. Mm. You had to send overseas. And then the feedback that we would often get is, from overseas publishers because I like your writing but your setting's too Australian. It's not appropriate for our audience. Um, so it was very uh, European or American-centric and I love that that has changed. And I think that's, the you know, the important thing for readers is to support our Australian authors and through libraries, uh, you know, we don't have to spend a lot of money to... No. Um, 
to support literature in Australia. Every time you borrow a book from the library, in fact, you're supporting an Australian author. So that's that's, maybe right. that's, I mean, I love to read authors from all over the world, but I particularly love to read Australian authors. Yes, um, and we're so lucky to have such wonderful Australian authors here at children's books and adult books. And, in fact, it was my first three books were set in America um, only in the last sort of five years because my editor wasn't confident that um, that an Australian book would be um, published or, or would be accessible to people all over the world. And um, that was proven wrong and my last two books have been set in Australia. And so that's things why are it's in, important, like the success of people like Jane Harper, for yes, instance. And Leanne Moriarty. Leanne Mar- and now and you as well, going into that worldwide audience and taking Australian settings to the world and saying, hey... Yeah, things happen here on the other side of the world That's too. Right. We, we have, you know, we don't all... just ride kangaroos no, around. Exactly. Yes. So, so no, you next go. question, you're. Ready. I'm anticipating the question. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of you. I was just going to say that um, we've obviously got uh, a lot of. We're in a library, and there's lots of readers hopefully following along. Can you give us some recommendations of what I you've can. been reading lately? I'm just talking about Australian settings and Australian authors. Mm. This is the latest book that came out on the same day as my book, in fact. Uh, this is from the latest book by B.M. Carroll, uh, Burr Carroll, who is an Australian author from Sydney, and this is an Australian setting uh, as well. Uh, this is a brilliant book. You've read this too. So good. Um, brilliant book about uh, a group of people in their 40s who are about to have their high school reunion and there's something sinister at play in the background. Um, so it's a bit of a mystery. It's a, it's a really, it's a dark book but um, really, I was going to say easy reading but I hate describing things as easy reading because it sounds like it's lightweight and it, this is definitely not lightweight. No. It's Easy reading is is difficult writing. It's, it's very yes, that's true, and it's I think it's very um, immersing, more immersive. Yeah, it? so it's it's a compelling read. Yes, is, is is how I would describe it. So um, that's one. If the library, if your li- local library's got that, or go out and buy that from that's available widely. This is another Australian author, which is Kirsty Manning. This one has got an international setting. It actually takes place in London, um, but it has an Australian character. Um, very uh, nice, hunky um, male lead, a male protagonist who um, is an Australian in this book. So um, that's that, That's just, a, I think, uh, an example of the depth and the variance of the type of literature we've got. You know, Australian yeah, authors are, are writing all sorts of things that this is um, historical. This has got dual timeline, but it's um, it's an historical got a big historical bent so and then the third one is oh, I one. Love this one this is not an Australian author but I've just finished this and I needed to talk about it this is A Good Neighbourhood by Therese Ann Fowler this I, I didn't read it in one sitting because I got to 4am and I had to go to bed oh. but it was it's the most compelling thing I've read yeah. in ages it was just uh, it's so basically it's about uh, it's really hard to describe what it's about isn't it yes, in terms it of without is. giving too much away but it's basically about a very nice neighborhood um and a family that moves in a, a nice family a very ordinary seemingly ordinary family and disrupts um the balance of what is going on and it, it leads to a lawsuit and then even more dire consequences mm. so What's so great about that book is that it does, as you say, everything's nice. It's the, the the writing's nice, the community's nice, and there's just this underlying menace, isn't there? Of and and deep themes like racism and and class, and you know, it's it's a really fantastic and the, book. it's I think it's so well done because it, you're you're drawn in to the characters' lives yes. so easily, and in the beginning. I found it hard to sort of see. I knew the menace was there, but I, it wasn't. There's not a clear cut villain. Like it wasn't as if, in, in the beginning yeah. at least, it wasn't as if you were thinking, "Oh, I dislike this character intensely, and I love this character, and yeah. they're complete. I'm completely on their side." It's very nuanced. It's true. Uh, I mean, things develop in a way where it becomes more clear cut. 
but um, at least in the beginning it's very nuanced and it makes you question your own thoughts Everything. about things. Yeah. It's a very, yeah, a, a book for deep thought but not like difficult to read. Like so mm. I, I'm someone that I'm lazy. I'm a lazy reader, aren't oh. I? Well, I, I, don't, I don't like to have things that are uh, you know, dense, that are yeah. very... I don't want to work too hard. I want to be drawn in by the characters and by the story and by the setting immediately. I don't want to have to think too hard because I'm lazy. And so I I appreciate books like this that make me examine, you know, big themes and make me mm. think a lot. I've, I finished this two days ago and I can't stop thinking about it. Um, and I really appreciate the author's skill in having drawn me to that place to make me examine my feelings and my values and my behaviours in such a, an enjoyable way. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. And I think this is probably a good point to jump in with a reader question from Jessica Reinmuth, which is who is your favourite author and why? And I know that's a really difficult, so you are welcome to have a few if you need to. Oh, look, it is difficult. Um, super difficult because I love so many uh, different authors and I've got such diverse taste in fiction. So I love everything from Sally Hepworth, of course. She had to I have that. to say that. No, but I do. And and what what viewers might not know is that I was a big fan of Sally's before we ever met um, and we did an event together in a bookshop which is a long story, which I, I, we probably haven't got time to tell, but we did an event together in a bookshop and I had been this big fan of Sally's and it was at my local bookseller. See, I'm going to go. I can't help it. I'm going to go, go in and it. tell, and tell the nice story. She's about me. She can talk as long as she wants. Um, so my local bookseller had said to me, would you like to do an event? I think this was, was it for The Shape of Us and you would have yes. had The Mother's Promise out at that yes. time. Yeah. So we had books out at a similar time. And um, the bookseller said to me, oh, I'd love to do an event for you. But she she didn't say this to me, but she was probably thinking, but who's going to come? Because, like, <laughs> you're not that well known. <laughs> and so she was probably thinking, maybe I'll get another author to come too. <laughs> this is earlier in my God. career. Um, so uh, she didn't say that to me. She said, oh, it'd be great to have. I'm reading, I've just read your book and I'm reading The Mother's Promise and um by Sally Hepworth. Have you heard of her? And I'm like, have I heard of her? Oh my God, I'm a huge fan. Yes, I've heard of her. Um, she said, would you like to do an event with her? And I said, well, yes, of course I would love to do an event with her. But I laughed. I said, as if, as if she's going to come all the way to Ocean Grove, do an event with me. Who no did it? she know that I pretty much would go anywhere? <laughs> and unbeknownst to her I'd been reading her book too and was very enamored with her and I think us authors get a bit that way about each other yeah we, we do I guess We're a bit so we girly. we did we did do an event together so yes so I, I, I love everything from that um sort of high-end commercial fiction I still read a little bit of romance so um I, I particularly like rural romance so I've got a, a few different uh, rural romance authors that I love including Rachel Johns who yeah. we we have a reader group with um but if we're talking all-time favourite, I can't go past Geraldine Brooks. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that. Which might seem odd because I tend to read contemporary fiction mm. and she writes really historical fiction, usually fiction based on a real-life historical event. Which but is funny because Lisa often proclaims that she does not read historical fiction. I know, but I, I'm <laughs> fussy with it is maybe what I should say. Um, I've got... But her writing is exquisite mm. and it does exactly what I said Therese Ann Fowler does. It draws you in. It's smart. It makes you think. It makes you examine your feelings and your behaviours and your values uses, using um, some part of history to illustrate this. But it's not heavy-handed. It doesn't, it's, it's not, you know, preachy. It just, you, you are brought to it. I don't know, gently. I don't know. She's just, she's a genius. So yeah. I love her. Um, and, of course, you know, I've got lots of, I, I do love, like I, I love Leanne Moriarty's work. Um, she's, you know, she's done so much for fiction, uh, as we has. talked about earlier, so Australian fiction. So I've got, you know, may, funny, funnily enough, mainly women writers, Me although too. I do love um, the work of Jock Sarong too. Mm. Um, he is another 
Australian author from down my side. Oh, we're claiming him. He lives like over 100 kilometres away oh, from me. But, I'm claiming um, him too and he doesn't <laughs> live anywhere near me. But, yeah, he's a brilliant, brilliant writer um, yeah. and I lo- and diverse. His stories are very diverse. Mm. Um, there's not two really that you could, although I think he's writing, I think I saw him say that he's writing perhaps a sequel to his last book, which Jeez. is unusual for him because um, all of his books have been quite different. But I particularly love, of his work, I particularly love um, On the Java Ridge. Yes. That, that plays into my, my um, love of politics. And I love um, uh, The Rules of Backyard Cricket mm. too. It's fantastic. That's a great one. Yeah. I think I've got two, time for two more questions um, before we close up. And one question which we also got from a reader, which I really liked, is uh, who is your, uh, sorry, if you could tell your younger self, your younger writing self, mm. anything, what would it be? Ooh, that's tricky. Um, I think it would be to really to write what you love like mm-hmm. not big not to get caught up in what will sell or what the market is and that it will be okay that it's like, like it might take a long time um but that if your heart's in it and if you don't give up if you are prepared to continue to persevere then eventually you'll make it i also think one of the maybe the most important thing about being pre-published is to enjoy that time. Yeah. Because I didn't realise when I was writing my first book, I was so desperate to be published that I I didn't actually enjoy the writing as much as I could if I didn't realise what a luxury it was to Mm. be able to have as much time as I needed to make that book perfect. Because once you've got contracts coming in, Uh, which is wonderful, like it, it's yeah. wonderful to be published and it, it's a dream come true, but there's always time pressure on you and, I, and you can, I'm always feeling like that there's something else I could have done to the book if only there'd been more time. And yeah. maybe that's true and maybe it's not, but when you're writing your very first novel, you've got all the time in the world. So take mm. that time and enjoy it and appreciate it and, you know, revel in talking with other aspiring authors and mm. enjoy it um, because there's it, once it becomes your job, it's it's a job. Yes. Like it's, still, it's a great job yep. but it's actually a job. That's great advice. I think that um, the time constraints of having dead, uh, deadlines and contracts and is huge but also just I think taking the time to really foster that love of writing and enjoy it and is really important as you go forward as well because we can get so caught up in the desperation to get published and for it to happen now um, but to really use that time to be a building block for yeah. a future career I think is, is really good advice. Um, so the last real question that I have it, which is really a leading question, <laughs> is uh, I thought it might be fun for you to tell people about our readers group, The Secret Life of Authors, that we run with uh, other Australian author Rachel Johns. Can you tell us a little bit about what people could expect for that from that group and what we do there and how they can sign sure. up? Sure. So The Secret Life of Authors was born, it started as a newsletter between the three of us. We thought it would be good for the three of us to have a combined newsletter and we wanted it to be a little bit different. We wanted to focus on the real life of authors rather than, so let readers know what goes on behind the scenes um, at an author of an author's life rather than like you get to see us at book launches and doing things like this and it looks kind of glamorous and glossy and fun and it is mm. not glamorous and, and glossy but no, fun, fun. Um, so but we wanted to people to see the real people behind you know behind the author so we started the the newsletter and we tell funny stories pretty much in the new we tell you about all our you know all the times we make fools of ourselves and mm, that's mostly know, it yeah mainly the time I choked on a bread roll when mm. I was when a more famous author than me came up and spoke to me and she was my heroine those types of things <laughs> so and worse so that was how it was born but then we start we really enjoyed doing the newsletter and we got started getting lots of reader feedback and we thought a Facebook group would be fun and so we have a Facebook group um 
if you can Google it, just put in into just search it on Facebook, The Secret Life of Authors. It's a reader group. Writers are welcome. If you're an aspiring author, you're very welcome. But we're we're not giving writing tips in The Secret Life of Authors. Occasionally it might come yeah. that sort of thing. We do talk about it a little bit, but it's for we the readers are the focus of the group and it's for readers to engage with us to find out about our new books and about anything they're not just our books anything that readers are uh, interested in anything that they're reading at the moment we and we've developed during um the lockdown we developed what was called a read-along and we've this sally's going to do this in the read-along next uh not next Mine is next, actually. Yes. The Secret Life of, of Shirley Sullivan starts this Sunday. And I'll just quickly, quickly tell you what a read-along is. So a read-along is like a book club where you read the book and discuss it. But in the read-alongs, we discuss it several times throughout the book. So we will say, okay, everyone's going to read to Chapter 15, then we're going to get together in a live on Sunday Um some one of us is going to host it and we're going to talk about the first 15 chapters and you can contribute and tell us what you thought and ask questions and they've been really popular people are really loving popular. them yeah. and so so far we've done uh we did uh what was it saving missy yes, um by one. beth murray then we did an almost perfect holiday by lucy diamond we've done rachel's latest release which is something to talk about we're about to start this one so if you want to join in you're very welcome you join the group and then you just have to be online um in the group on, on what, four o'clock on sunday mm -hmm. kelly rimmer author uh the author, Australian author Callie Rimmer is running this one. We usually do them, but if it's one of our books, we get a guest host. So Callie's doing that. And then the next one after that will be this book with Sally. But we don't just do read-alongs. We have, you know, competitions, book chat. A lot of book recommendations that come from members of the group mm. who will say, I just read The Secret Life of Shirley Sullivan. Who else has read it? Or has anyone read this book? I'm thinking of buying it or borrowing it. Um, we also go on once a month and do a live where we talk about anything you want us to. Maybe we could talk about plotting or covers or going on tour or whatever readers, it is. Readers will pop in and say, I'd like to know about how you how you decide on your covers. And we go, okay, well, we'll talk about that in our next live. Yeah, so, so there's a whole lot of stuff in there. Yeah. Um, and it's a, a great little group to follow. So it's the secret life of authors. So I think that just about takes us up to time. So I want to thank anyone who has watched along with us uh, this far and thank you especially to Lisa for sharing your time thank and experience you. um, with us today and also just a final reminder that The Secret Life of Shirley Sullivan can be downloaded from the Kingston Library's e-audio collection and you can also purchase it at all good bookstores. So thank you so much, Lisa, for being with us today. Thanks for having me and thank you so much to the library and to the staff here today who've come in to uh, do this live stream for us. We really appreciate your time and yeah so please come on into get onto the Kingston Library. Do they do they how are they borrowing online at the moment through the web through the Facebook page through the through the yeah so if you get onto the web if you get onto the website or the Facebook page there'll be instructions. All right bye. Thank you bye.